This is a challenge for disclosures. I, I have no financial disclosures. My probably biggest disclosure is I, I don't have the answers to this. I'm going to show you my thoughts, some data. Uh, this is really a challenging problem. And I think the general goals are the same. For burst fractures in this group of patients, the low energy, it's alignment, stability, neurology, maintain function, minimize pain. The do no harm part plays a much bigger role. And I will tell you that most of these should still be treated non-operatively. So we're talking a lot about operative stuff, but the vast majority of these I still treat non-operatively. Um, the difference with this and the younger burst fractures, these are low energy, there's poor bone quality, they're generally sicker patients, and they often have a lot of degenerative stuff going on around these fractures that may dictate or contribute to what you can and can't do to them. So quite often the role of osteoporosis is unrecognized. People can say, oh, I got a burst fracture, and you get this scenario. You can see this patient always has the obligatory spinal cord stimulator. I don't have one yet in my area. I got to get one because apparently everyone needs one. So they've got one. So she has some longstanding pain. You see they did this. I I'm not sure that did any good. It's the same as it was. And it did this shortly over time. And so I think they, I don't know if they failed to recognize this patient became very miserable. Their, 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 their ribs are on their pelvis. That's what she complains about. And she ends up with this. This is not ideal. Um, so what kind of strategies? Multiple points of fixation is one strategy. Spreading out the fixation. It may be that we need less screw density. In other words, we may not need a screw at every level or multiple screws. Maybe we make a sort of a, a more flexible construct. Maybe titanium rods are better than cobalt chrome in this situation. I don't know that we know that yet. It, you tend to be able to do this better posteriorly to spread it out. Anterior, the concept of anterior support becomes important. We saw that classification, the gains classification. Maybe in these patients that's very important. Uh, cement augmentation, shortening of the spine is, is a very good strategy I'll show you. And you need to maybe include some of the degenerative changes. You have to at least take that into account. And I'm going to go through some examples. So this is a patient that came in with some deficit, a burst fracture. This is a low energy injury. It, osteoporosis is a big role. You can see the cord changes in this patient. In this patient, we just, rather than try a short segment construct that we might otherwise do, uh, in a young patient, we're going we're gonna to use two, two levels above and two below. We're going to really lay this out. And we can, we can decompress the canal adequately in this patient with a tamp in the back, simply make a hemilaminotomy, and we can push those fragments forward. You see we've nicely evacuated the canal. This is an MRI that was done down the road for other purposes. And we don't have to destroy that body, and we can maintain that without exposing them to additional morbidity of a more anterior per surgery. So even if you recognize osteoporosis and you use multiple points of fixation, you can use these principles, and I will tell you, things still go awry. This is an example. This is a 57-year-old female. She was seen at age 57 for back pain. So this is someone that already has back pain issues. She comes in, and, and now she's got this odd fracture complex, proximal muscle weakness. You can see when she stands, this is severely kyphotic. You can see she actually retropulses this body posteriorly on the one below. And she's got some, some changes down here at her conus. This is a big problem because she's already got chronic back pain. She's got a lot of degenerative change. She's got a degenerative lysthesis at 4-5. So we said, okay, we're going to use our multiple point of fixation concept. We're going to get her aligned. We'll stabilize her. We'll hold her. And that, that looks pretty good. And initially she did well, and it, it looks good. We're kind of happy with that. But five months later, she comes in with marked increase in back pain. Two issues. She's already getting lucency around that screw, and she's got a compression fracture below it at L4. All right? We can handle that. You know, we would we'll do a kyphoplasty on her. We'll try to get her some pain relief, provide stability. Eight months later, so she's doing fair, some back pain. Ten months later, she starts to get a sacral compression, a sacral insufficiency fracture. So her, her disease process isn't gone. We're treating the osteoporosis in the meantime, which all our patients get. 
Five years later, after the initial thing, she now has an L5 compression fracture. She gets a kyphoplasty, little venous curly Q. Didn't cause her any venoplasty, problems. Right? Well, venoplasty, yeah. Um, so now she's seven years out from all this. She's now 68. She's struggling with the fuse back pain. And she's, you can see her deformity is getting worse and worse. Ten years later, she's now 70. She's becoming more disabled. She wants something done. Her ribs are on her pelvis. She is miserable. We start her on for Teo, and she ends up with this. This is a big, huge deal. So you can see we thought we were doing a good job all along, and, and it's hard to know what to do. And a lot of this is just progression of the disease, but this is the complexity of this problem. And when you see these patients, you need to start warning them that this is what may happen. Now, no matter how good of a job I do on you, you may continue to progress all around what we did. If they come in with a deficit, you know, anterior surgery is great. We can evacuate the canal. In the young, healthy patient, we can do a beautiful job evacuating the canal. In the older patient, like this guy who fell, and it's kind of a type B burst, um, we try to get cutesy in him. We tried to avoid surgery. We stood him up. He was kyphosing. He also has a fracture down at five. We didn't want to do posterior instrumentation and end up close. So we thought, we'll do an anterior thing. This was a no number of years ago. And so we did an anterior procedure. He looked good at first, but you'll see what happens over time. He just kyphosis, kyphosis more, and now we've got a problem. We, and having not, not done a multi-level thing below, now we've got a bigger problem. And what happens with the anterior stuff, that body is not very strong, and the, it just rocks around the screws. It's just not adequate. It doesn't do it. It doesn't do the trick. You can get away with it, and, and around this same time frame, we had this lady that came in with a burst, and we did her anterior, but I actually went above and below and snuck anterior screws above and below and tried to increase the length of my construct, and, and this lady, we got away with it. So anterior surgery by itself in, the, in these osteoporotic patients, it's, it's very tricky. The fixation is just not as good, and it's much harder to do long segments and create long lever arms. So usually when we're doing anterior, it's because we wanted to either decompress it from anterior in addition to posterior, or we're trying to provide anterior column support. This is an example of atypical anterior column support to get to the question of sternum. So this is a 64-year-old female, low energy motor vehicle accident, neuro intact. She's got a uh, T12 compression fracture from it. And up high at five and four, she has this type B fracture with a sternal fracture. You can see it better here. So she's got a sternal fracture. She's got that fourth column that you talked about. Well, we felt like the upper thoracic fracture needed fixation. We wouldn't have fixed the T12 otherwise, but we said, we're going to the OR. We'll just do some, oh, and no fractures in between. So we try to get cute, it is very cute. We just did some perk screws down here like an internal brace, and we said, we'll open this, because at the time we didn't like, you know, like perk things up here. So we opened it, and we fixed it up there, because we thought that needed fix. Well, you can see already on her initial standing film, she's starting to look kyphotic. You can see two weeks later, she's really kyphotic, and the screws at the upper part are just starting to plow through the body, and you can see what's happening with her sternal fracture. She's just collapsing down through this osteoporotic bone. This just is not going to hold her. We, 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 the other mistake I think we made is we tried to go short at the bottom end of this because we didn't want to get close to this, okay, without connecting it. And so, you know, that, that's just not enough. It's just not going to hold that curve. So this lady, we had to go back. We had to extend it. We had to connect it, and we plated her sternum. We fixed, the, we fixed that fourth column. That held pretty well, but I will tell you that's, and many of these, that's not the end of the story because now she wants to kyphose below. She's developed this. We've actually took out the bottom rods because she didn't want me to extend it down just because they were prominent, and we're not done here. We're not done. We'll be back. She's going to look like our other lady to here, I think, before long. She's a very active, nice lady, but we can't, it's very hard to do much about this disease. Cement augmentation can help. 
Um, I don't know if it helps with those problems. You can augment screws. You can augment above and below screws. Uh, so you can do it within the, within the fractured body for support. You can augment your screws. You can augment adjacent levels trying to prevent this. These are all reasonable strategies. There are no good comparative data on this. There, there's case series you can see. So if you do it within the fractured body, you could just do a kyphoplasty and say, I'm not trying to address the deformity or stability. I'm just doing it for pain control. You can do it in the body for to add anterior column support. If you have a neuro deficit and you feel like you need to evacuate the posterior wall, you've taken that option away, really. So you're going to have to find some other way to augment the support because there's no way the cement's going to stay in the wall. You're going to have a, a too great of a risk of extravasation. When we first started doing cement augmentation, the rule was if the posterior wall is fractured, no cement augmentation. There are papers looking at that now for burst fractures. There's a few of them, all case series. This one actually had deficits. They actually decompressed the canal just with ligament attacks through the screws. They correct it with the screws, use a balloon height, and then just apply anterior column support. In this paper, they looked at how much cement extravasation they actually saw, and they looked at A1 fractures, which just compression, and then they looked at the burst. And, and, and these are the intraspinal cement. So it, it wasn't excessive. They had no new deficits. Uh, they did have two patients. They thought they had 30, more than 30% of the canal filled with cement, and they went back and took the cement out. So no deficits, but not benign. This paper, they had 22% cement extravasation, but in this burst fracture paper, none in the canal. They, they really emphasize staying in the front, use, trying to use viscous cement, trying to inject less cement than the balloon fill. Uh, I, I would be cautious of papers where there's nothing in the canal. I, I tend to believe that other paper a little better. Um, to prevent this problem, people have tried to come up with other things. And I don't know if any of these are available in the US, but in Europe, they've got some expandable containment devices. I just am not sure that this little bit of elevation is really that meaningful. Uh, I don't know. I don't have any experience with this, but I threw it in there because this is somebody's attempt to try to help uh, mitigate some of these issues. This is one of my patients, and although this is a tumor patient, same sort of principles. This, this is an 83-year-old patient who's healthy, lives alone on a farm, really active. Uh, she comes in with new bilateral leg weakness, bad back pain. It turns out she's got metastatic renal cell, new diagnosis. This is a healthy 83-year-old lady. You can see her bone quality on that CT is horrendous creating a huge problem for us. And so this is somebody we did an anterior decompression. We provided anterior support, but we cemented all our screws. This is one I use fenestrated screws on, which we talked last night, makes me nervous if I ever have to revise it. Um, but the fenestrated screws can help you augment the screws. And she's, she's about six months out right now. And so far that's held up. So there are a host of ways to maximize screw fixation. I borrowed these from Daryl Brodke. Uh, you can, we know that the decreased bone mineral density decreases the pullout. I would avoid manipulation of screws once you put them in uh, because that's one way that you can, when you get all your screws in connected, the whole body's strong, but if you manipulate one screw, it's not very strong in itself. You can triangulate the screws as best you can, try to keep them close to the end plate. You can make sure your screws get into the body about 80% as opposed to 50%. That will help. Uh, adding points of fixation, broad anterior column support, you know, something that really gets, uh, uh, has a nice footprint up front. Uh, expandable screws can help. I don't have much experience with expandable screws. Cementing screws helps. Uh, Expanding the cement bolus beyond the screw helps even more. And then fenestrated screws may even be better in terms of fixation, but have some downsides like we talked about in the revision situation. 
The other issue to be cognizant of, they have pre-existing degenerative conditions. So this is a patient, 80 year old, that prevented us four weeks ago, severe onset of new back pain. That's probably when she got her L4 compression fracture, but she had significant pre-existing stenosis. So then what happens is she starts to progressively lose her ability to ambulate. We know most stenosis patients don't get weak, but when they have a sudden event, they don't get weak because it comes on gradually. This suddenly narrowed her canal more. Even though it's not a lot of retropulsion, she started getting muscle weakness. And so this patient needs a stenosis surgery, but in the face of an anterior loss of the ability of the spine to resist anterior load. And so if you do a laminectomy in the back of this, you've got a real problem. This is someone who we did some cement augmentation in addition to just a decompression of her cauda equina. If you look at this lady, you can see she has a severe burst fracture, significant deformity, but degenerative scoli immediately below that. That's a huge problem. Um, here she is standing, ribs are digging into her abdomen, she's miserable, and this is in the subacute phase. You can see she's tenting her cord over this. This is a patient who I'll consider for a shortening procedure. And I think we can achieve stability by doing a shortening where we resect that part of the spine. You don't even have to take the discs out. You can leave a little nub in a bone, shorten them down for realignment, and you get the stability rather than jack open the front and try to achieve the stability that way. And this is what we did in her. You can see that position. She looks great. We said, OK, we're going to try not to get all the way into this degenerative scully. You can see she's already getting loose and sees. Doesn't take long for her to have problems. And although her alignment is good and that's held, it's the degenerative stuff below that that's given us tremendous grief. And she ends up with this eventually. So those problems also have to be taken into account. This is from a paper. I put it in. I don't mean for you to read this. But this goes through a whole bunch of papers that were different strategies. And every strategy is different. So there's certainly no consensus, and I think the more of these strategies you're familiar with, the more you can individualize your treatment. And is there any evidence for fractures with neurology? This is an interesting paper because it compared three strategies. One is anterior surgery, adding anterior surgery. One is shortening, and then one is supplementing with cement augmentation. No difference in neurology. All pretty favorable because it's low energy. The, comp the more you did anterior, posterior shortening, obviously the more complications you had. Uh, and loss of correction is the main problem in all of those surgeries. So summary, osteoporotic burst fractures, they're a very complex issue. Uh, remember, most can be treated non-operatively. And, and if you can get away with non-operative treatment, you avoid a lot of this. Neurology really drives us towards surgery, and that's when you have to employ a lot of these issues. You've got to take into account the pre-existing degenerative conditions. That's a little different than the young high-energy trauma. And if you take them on surgically, you've got to have unique strategies to protect your instrumentation. Thank you. Outstanding, John. Thank you.